All right. Thanks for having me. This is great to be here in Vietnam. I got in late last night, so if I start to nod off, just throw something at me. Wake me up. Uh, so I'm James Daniels. I'm uh, developer relations with Google on the Firebase team. And today I want to talk to you about using Cloud Firestore to achieve huge scale, massive scale, cool applications. If it's going to work now. <laughs> Technology, right? There we go. All right. So many of us these days, right, when, when we're building, we want to build applications that keep data in the cloud, right? Uh, a lot of applications you can get by on the device. It's great for prototyping. But once you start scaling your application, growing it, you want to bring it to the cloud. You want to store things on databases. Uh, you want to you know, make it so users can have multi-device experiences, profiles, stuff like that, as well as monetization that comes with the cloud. Now, everyone knows like the pitfalls of, of running your own servers, whether that be GCP, Amazon, what be it, right? You have to manage them. You have to uh, you know, have ops teams keep them up and stable, handle peek throughputs, handle you know, very few users coming into your application. Uh, and, and ultimately, you don't want to be overpaying for your infrastructure, and you need to be able to handle scale when you need it, right? So these are hard problems. And this is the typical approach, right? So you have this tiered infrastructure um, where you have your database servers and API, auth, sync, and you know, your SQLite. So ultimately, right, you have this database tier. You have your DBAs, strong opinions, MySQL. Maybe you're using a new NoSQL solution, right? And this is the canonical layer in your application. Then you have servers that are maybe JSON API or GraphQL that you know, allow your clients to interact with that. And there's a lot of pitfalls in here. Ultimately, you know, if you're going a cloud-centric approach, this is this model that uh, you know, if you've been building this stuff, this is what you're familiar with this three-tiered application. So you have your presentation layer. This includes your, your applications, right? Uh, this is, includes your iOS, Android applications, your web applications. And then they go ahead and speak to your CDN or your API gateway, maybe some orchestration layer in there for A-B testing and experiments, analytics. Um, and then they talk to your cloud servers, right? They talk to your cloud servers, which the cloud servers are trusted and can access your database, whether it be Mongo, MySQL, Postgres, uh, you know, or, or any of our cloud offerings. Now, here with all these arrows, right, these are all places that you can you know, make mistakes. These are all places where you can introduce bottlenecks and complexity. right? And in a way, this sort of academic three-tiered architecture is a lie. Because say you need to add offline capabilities to your application. right? You have your DBAs, your database professionals that have strong opinions on schemas and computer science concepts. And now all of a sudden, you're building you know, databases here on, on your client side for offline capabilities. And what I like about Firebase is it changes this. Um, so using GCP, right, you can talk to Cloud Firestore or any of our offerings in this sort of three-tiered architecture. Now, Cloud Functions serverless technology allows you to scale. So we can actually do event-driven development with Firebase. So this is Cloud Functions. Who here has used Cloud Functions for Firebase? All right, not many. A lot of, lot of native developers here, right? Uh, so cloud functions allow you to, on the server side, uh, write hooks to your database. So they listen to your database. Say a user updates uh, some part in the database, this script can run on the server. It'll scale to infinity. 
and it'll do any side effects that are needed. Um, that way you're taking some of that critical load off of your client. Say it's sending an email or a text message or altering something else in the database. Um, and so this sort of becomes that model. We have this three-tiered architecture plus Cloud Functions on the end to have side effects. So whenever your database is written to, then the side effects happen. You don't, you're taking a lot of logic out of this compute layer. It becomes much, much easier to develop. To develop. Now, this is a, sort of the state of things for the past five, six years if you're building a modern application uh, backend, right? Is, is you have this three-tier architecture, you maybe are introducing serverless into the mix, and ultimately Firebase the startup, right? This is one of the things that they identified as a, as a core thing, right? It's that the real-time database added this real-time nature, so no more of this pull to refresh experience. Um, you have your database, it's a JSON store, very simple, scales pretty well. Um, and ultimately, the best part is none of you need to worry about servers, right? You just interact with Firebase. It's an API, just like you'd work with your SQLite database locally, but now it's cloud enabled, right? Who here has used the real-time database? Had a couple of people, nice. So there, there are downsides with the real-time database though. It was, it was revolutionary at the time, but this was you know, many years ago. So the main things that, that we wanted to address was to increase the scalability of the real-time database, right? Uh, applications are getting more popular, a lot more users. Uh, a lot of people in the world now have cell phones in their pocket. So the scale problems are, are much bigger now. Um, the real-time database, those of you that have used it, might know that you know, the querying wasn't great. It was a very fast database, but it didn't have a lot of the same features as a traditional database. And you know, we wanted to keep this, this offline capability and then extend it also to web applications. So this is Cloud Firestore, right? This is the Firebase team, the real-time database, combined with you know, the best of Google Cloud. It's been a work in progress for a couple of years. Who here has used Firestore in production? Got a couple people, nice. You loving it, loving it? Yeah. Uh, so really this is the idea that you know, the, the combining of the brains, the startup Firebase when it was acquired by Google, and then the best and brightest minds at Google building this very awesome database technology. And so as an introduction here, um, the, the main things that you get when you use Firestore for your database is you know, this effortless real-time synchronization. Uh, it's not as hard nowadays to do web sockets and stuff like that, but the idea is that when your client interacts with the database, you're not just getting data once. You have the option of querying the database and then keeping a listener open. So whenever data changes on the database, it will stream those changes to the client, right? Uh, within milliseconds. It's this very magical experience. And you know, this kills the, the pull to refresh model, right? You have information on the page, the database changes on the server, the database changes locally, it just you know, re-renders. And the common pattern, especially to get going, the common pattern is to put your rendering code, your drawing code, right in that database callback. Um, you know, on top of that, you can, of course, add optimizations like recycling on your table, table view or whatnot. But that gives you that very magical experience very, very quickly. Um, another cool thing here is this offline mode. Now, Firestore is not an offline first database. It's really meant to be in complement to the cloud. But the idea is that, you know, to you, the developer, you don't have to worry about whether or not the user's connected to the internet and do things like, oh, well, I'm going to write to my local SQL database and then, 
you know, when they have internet connectivity again, reconnect to the, the, the GraphQL API and write things up. And what you've done there is, you know, if you do all that yourself, A, that's a lot of code, right? And a lot of things that you could get wrong. Uh, you could have network timeouts, you could have, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's hard to tell if, if uh, the user's connected to the internet, right? Or maybe your servers are just down, or, you know, yada, yada. And then everywhere in there, you've just introduced more potential bottlenecks, right? Slow code. Um, code that won't let you scale to, you know, 20 million users, 100 million users. So these are all opportunities that, you know, by using Google's technology, by using Firebase, it's transparent to you that it's offline enabled and, you know, it can scale. And ultimately, what this means for you, the developer, the, the entrepreneur, the enterprise developer, what be it, is that you can move faster. You can build more powerful, more robust, more scalable applications quicker. And that is very important that you, know, you get to market faster, you get a product out there faster, and you interact with your customers faster. So developing better things faster is very important for business. So the, the, the Firestore backend, right, uh, we support sophisticated set of security rules, which along with Firebase authentication and cloud functions allows you to build a secure application, a fast application without much code on your side. And you don't have to worry about servers and databases, which is the best part. Uh, I, you know, I've developed iOS and Android applications, but for the most part, I, I used to be a back-end developer. And what I love about Firebase is now I don't need to manage servers. I don't have to worry about them going down. You know, what I can do is I can take my front-end knowledge. I could take my, the Kotlin that I know, the JavaScript that I know, the Swift that I know, build a cool application, and then take that and, and then put those into Cloud Functions and do all this without servers. And it's part of the Google Cloud family, right? It has the best, best technologies there. It integrates with the rest of these and, you know, very awesome technology. So because it's built on top of Google Cloud Platform, we can take these sophisticated platforms um, we can add multi-region support, right? So Firestore allows for multi-regions now. Uh, you can actually, you know, set it up in an Asian data center uh, and, you know, get that much closer to your users. This, these were things that were hard with Firebase as a startup. Uh, we have strong consistency and tra multi-document transactions, which are very, very cool for a NoSQL solution. So, you know, we're, we're taking this model where your app talks to the compute, talks to your database, maybe, you know, you've modernized with Cloud Functions, but what we've done is, is here, right, most people in the room, you're probably focused on this. And then you just have the server guys. And then the server guys have the database guys. And these people, laugh at these people saying they're not real developers, and then these people laugh at these people saying that they're not real developers, right? So not only are you increasing the agility, but you're getting rid of those potential for flame wars. And you simplify the stack, right? Now your client application just talks to the database. And then, you know, all the side effects, all the server side, logic happens in these cloud functions that move very quickly and get things done fast. So what I really geeked out on when I started working on the Firebase team, what I loved the concept of was when I mentioned in that three-tier architecture the lie, the academic lie of, you know, your data is over here, you know, there's really strong computer science people thinking about that and people that know how to make databases scale. What Firestore and the real-time database before it have done is they've sort of brought the data layer 
to the entire stack, right? So your mobile application, you no longer have this, oh, the SQLite database that you know, the DBAs pick on and say that it's not a real database. You now have Cloud Firestore through the whole stack, right? Uh, and then if we're talking about scale, in the middle here, in, in the server infrastructure, caching, right? So if you have Redis or Memcache or something like that to make your application server faster, well, that's just another database, right? And of course, you have your, your fans, so big databases here. But by adding this data layer all across all three tiers, you've you know, increased your agility, your potential to scale, and you know, you've, you've simplified some of these arguments between your back-end developers and front-end developers. And the cool thing here is this tight integration. right? Firebase, you could, you could definitely build all this yourself. Uh, you could build it on Google Cloud Platform like, like Firebase has done. But we also have these really cool tie-ins, the tight integrations with you know, the, the Firebase authentication, the Google, um, and Google Analytics. So these strong tie-ins allow you to build those robust applications fast. And of course, for any side effects, sending emails, sending text messages, you know, logging users in, Servers calling other servers, that's what cloud functions are for, right? It's, it's serverless in the way that eating at a restaurant is kitchenless. There is a kitchen at the restaurant. You're not the one that has to manage the kitchen, though. Someone else does. Whereas if you're cooking at home, you need to manage the kitchen and do all the dishes. So uh, if you, if you want to build a 20 million uh, user 200 million user application, well, now you need to have a good enough kitchen for 200 million users, or you just send it to Google, and we'll do all that for you. Now, especially server people and like the database people, when they hear about me talking about this model, where you just directly interact with your database, they always kind of freak out because there's security, right? Um, now, this is a whole nother topic, and and one that we'll definitely get into in code labs. Um, but how do we make it secure, right? You're talking to the database. So we have Firebase security rules. So you know, this is a, a, a small little DSL that goes along with the, the, the database. And it ties in with Firebase authentication. So like I mentioned, all these stitching all these products together gives you a much better experience. So these go along with your database, and you can you know, write in this DSL listening to certain paths in the database. And you can allow certain operations or disallow them based off the user. Right? So you could allow them if the user is authenticated. Or you could deny any rights from a user whose billing has lapsed. Right? And this allows you to take, again, the rest of that logic that your intermediary API servers were doing and allows you to offload that to the database and let Google do that work. So the model here is this a document-based model um, rather than you know, a strict schema SQL type thing. And it has rich data types. So when you write to a document in Firestore, you can have strings, numbers, you know, uh, vectors, arrays, all that good stuff. But when you're designing for scale, you have to think beyond that. There is, of course, you have this top level collection. But the cool thing here is it nests, right? So a document can have sub collections. Those sub collections can have documents underneath them, et cetera, et cetera. And it creates this tree model. What's very cool here is if you're a developer on the real time database, you can deeply nest data like this, sure. But when you fetched that root document, it would have gotten everything below it. So in Firestore, things are nice and shallow. So when you fetch a document, you don't automatically get the documents along with it, underneath of it. You have to also query those. So we'll query for this document, and we get this back from you know, the databases. And this could be local. This could be in cache. This could be from the cloud. It doesn't matter to you, the developer. You just write this query. 
um, and it returns the data. And the cool thing is, is that this will scale up. You don't have to worry about any of that, right? Um, there's also one very cool thing that I geek out on here is when I'm querying 10 documents, so see limit 10 here. When I'm querying 10 documents from the database, one of the guarantees that Firestore gives me is that if I have 100 records in my database and I'm only querying 10, or if I have 100 million records and I'm only querying 10 of them, the performance will be the same. Uh, this is a really cool superpower with Firestore because if you're thinking about traditional databases, uh, especially you know, the, the you know, schema-less ones, um, if you have 100 million documents in your database or, or a billion documents in your database, what happens is, well, with a, a well-designed database, it's typically linear. Your queries get a little slower over time as the database grows. If you've poorly designed your database, right, it's, it's going to be some quadratic curve. It's very, very bad, where now you have a billion records in your database, and the, the query that was very fast when you were developing now takes 30 seconds in production. And then you have to hire people to figure that out, and they suggest a redesign, and there's a lot of complexity. So this guarantee is that if you're developing it and it's fast, if you have 10 friends playing with your application and it's fast, and then you go get 100,000 users for your application and it explodes in popularity, it's still going to be as fast as when you developed it. And for me, that's, that's a really cool guarantee. So how do the data structures look, right? Uh, so how the data structures work can affect your performance, right? Think, think about these. So especially since we allow you know, rich data in here, one thing you have to think about is, is the model of getting that data. So I have this vector in here, x, y, z. Uh, maybe this is, this is a lot of stuff. Uh, the Firestore records can be a megabyte. So maybe you're shoving a lot of information in here. But does the user need all of that, right? So yeah, the queries are fast, but you're still sending potentially a megabyte for every document that you're reading down the wire. So how can we, how can we change this model? So one thing that we can do, right, is we can actually take this data out. Maybe, maybe the user doesn't care about this data yet. Maybe this is just the list view, and when they click into it, then they see the details. So when you're fetching the list, you don't care about those vectors. Um, so, so one approach that you could take is maybe there's some extra details in a subcollection, and maybe it's specially named underneath that document. So that's one approach. Uh, another way you could do this is split it up even further, where you have your, your top-level collection, and maybe you've broken the vectors out, x, y, and z. Uh, one thing to consider here with Firestore is the main billing mechanism is actually the operations on the database, right? So you need to balance the number of documents being read, which is where you're billed when interacting with Firestore, versus the amount of data coming down the pipe to the user and the cost on them. So there's always these trade-offs, right? Um, and ultimately, you know, I mentioned we're getting rid of these API servers in this, in this Firestore model. One way to think about designing this database is, well, if you are writing a spec to your backend developers who no longer exist, I mean, they do stuff, but you know, they're not a bottleneck anymore, what API would you ask them to build, right? So think about it that way. This is both your database and your API. So if you were to spec something out asking them for a JSON API, what would that look like? And model your data that way. And of course, that's not the end of, of these. We can also um, actually shallow things up. So now we're no longer under a subcollection. We're under another top-level collection. And then we can query these individually based off the, the bird ID, right? This is starting to look more like a traditional database where you have multiple top-level collections 
and you query on them. And this is not just, you know, uh, a matter of opinions, but also performance. These all have implications, size to the user and cost to you. And you have to strike that balance. Now, to strike that balance, let's think about, you know, the, the, the limitations. So the primary one that I mentioned already is each document, each individual document, uh, these, they, they can only be a, a megabyte in size, right? Not that you'd want to shove a megabyte into a document. Maybe you're querying 100 of them, and then the user has to download 100 megabytes, right? So think about that. But this is, this is one of the things to keep in mind. This is uh, you want to shrink it down as much as possible, but you can go deep. You can make a large data structure. But then, you know, there's other products, right? So if you're storing images, you don't want to put the image, the base64 data in your database. Go ahead and use cloud storage for that, right? There's, there's different products. So think about, you know, using different technology for this. Um, maybe this doesn't affect you as a startup or a small company, but the bigger companies have to think about this. Is in your entire database, you get 40,000 indices. So an indice is going to be you know, that, that key into the database, but it's also going to be on every unique field. So this is a NoSQL database, right? So you can write any field you want into the data structure. But in order to make, make it, the querying on that fast, we automatically create indices for each new field in the database. So you can query on those. Now, if you're a big company, that might not work for you. If you're a small one, that's cool, it's performance, it's awesome. But there's probably a lot of unnecessary data that you don't care about querying on those indices. And in Firestore, one of the things that you can do is you can turn off these automatic indices. Um, so if you're a bigger company, you can turn those off and you can choose to index, uh, make the queries fast for, for only specific ones. Um, and this is the one that especially smaller companies, more agile startups are going to run into as they grow, is on Firestore, you're only allowed one update, write, et cetera, per, and this is individual document. So if you have a user or, or a widget or one individual document that a lot of users are interacting with, Maybe there's a timestamp on there, or an upvote count, a downvote count, the number of comments on a blog post. One thing to think about there is that you can only write to that object once per second in a sustained manner. If you have you know, an hour where, where a single blog post is very, very popular, and you, people leaving comments, and you have a comment count as a number on that document. If it's, if it's really popular and a lot of people are posting within an hour, it's probably fine. Now, if that sustains over the course of a day, a week, yada, yada, where, where you have a very popular blog post with a lot of upvotes, a lot of downvotes, and you have more than one of these operations per second, those are going to start timing out and failing. Uh, there's ways around this, of course, right? Uh, we could go ahead and use cloud functions. So one of the things that we could do is sort of batch up our writes. We could say, oh, we'll trip a cloud function whenever it writes. Maybe, oh, check if the document was updated within the past five seconds. If it wasn't, let's just queue these up. But if you're familiar with cloud functions, that starts sounding like a lot of complicated code, right? Stuff that you can get wrong, uh, stuff that you know, maybe you're introducing a bottleneck. Uh, or additional complexity. So ultimately, that's because Cloud Functions is meant for this very quick interaction when, when a user writes to the database. So, so a user updates you know, some, some blog post, and you want to send out a push notification to users. You want that to happen fast, right? Um, they're on demand, so when one crashes, it doesn't take out the others. And again, for this immediate fulfillment. So maybe the model's not right there. So the nice thing here is, you know, I mentioned that we're part of Google Cloud. Just because Firebase shows that as our concurrency model doesn't mean you have to, 
right? So there's other options. So one I like is Cloud Dataflow. When you start getting into these very complex cases, a nice thing for the, the people in this room, Cloud Dataflow, you know, Cloud Functions is, is written in Node.js by default. There's different variants of it. But uh, Cloud Dataflow has a Java, Java option. So you're probably a little bit more familiar with programming those. Uh, and ultimately, this is a stream-based processing. It's meant for big data, large batches. And especially if you're talking about a popular upvote, downvote on an article, number of comments, stuff like that, this is really great for this. And it can scale to millions and millions of operations per second. So compared to Cloud Functions, right, uh, one of the things that's nice is especially when you're dealing with legacy APIs. Um, I don't know what the payment ecosystem is like here, probably more modern than it is in the United States and Europe, where we have a lot of legacy APIs, SOAP-based APIs, you know, uh, bad, bad, bad APIs. We, we have a lot of them. One of the problems with Cloud Functions is Cloud Functions can fire more than once. They're very fast. If we don't know if it succeeded, we want to get that job done. So it's going to refire. And you have to think about this and make Cloud Functions idempotent. But one of the nice things about Dataflow, while it's not instantaneous, it can take a couple minutes to spin up the queue, you know, start processing jobs, it actually handles this for you already. So each trip of a data flow is only going to happen exactly once. So it deduplicates those events for you. Um, Cloud Functions, right, is meant to handle big bursts of activity where you don't understand the number of users, and it's just meant to be done really, really fast. Whereas Dataflow being a batch processing, it can look at, oh, the number of upvotes and downvotes per second versus how long it takes me to write to the database how many workers do I need at any given time? And Dataflow, well, will balance servers more intelligently and you know, have better concurrency. Uh, and then ultimately, the main thing here is that functions is meant for immediate fulfillment. It's meant for a user clicks a button, a user creates their first account or hits that forgot password link. It's for those immediate things where you, the user needs input, whereas this is really meant for more functional programming over streams where you know, latency isn't is as much of a concern as you know, predictable costs and scaling. So Cloud Dataflow, and uh, you know, ultimately, these are uh, you know, one, one piece of Google platform. Um, now, how, how do the queries work in Firestore? Let me touch back on that. So ultimately, I mentioned these indices. And you know, they look a lot like this. It's just a table. And when you query something, right, uh, say we're looking up all the Japanese restaurants, what it's going to do is it's going to look for the, the first Japanese restaurants and scan over the table. This is how those queries look. Now, when you have these compound queries, right, you're querying on multiple items, say I want to get Japanese restaurants with a rating of four, you have these composite indices, right? And these are just, again, scans, where it looks for the first restaurant that matches that, and it scans down the index until it finds it. Now, in the real-time database, you definitely could have done this yourself, right? Um, but the cool thing is Firestore does it for you. Um, now, things that you can't do, right? There's all kinds of, uh, I've had really smart computer scientists explain to me, you know, the, the performance implications and the technology. There's certain things you can't do here or can't do easily out of the box that you can with a traditional database, right? Um, Firestore has no full text searching. Right? You can't search over a bunch of articles or products and say, I want every product that has the word blue somewhere in its description. Right? You can't do that. Uh, there's other tools that do that. Right? You can integrate with those, especially with Cloud Functions. But that's something that Firestore can't do easily out of the box. You'll need back-end people thinking about how to achieve that. Um, you can't have multiple ranges in a single query. Because I mentioned how those indices work, is they're just composite tables. It finds the first document, 
and then reads all the way until it no longer matches. So a side effect of that is that if you wanted all restaurants with a rating greater than four and less than an average cost of two dollar signs, right, um, you can't do that. Uh, you need to do multiple things or filter that first query. Uh, this is something the Firestore team's thinking about how to approach, but we want to do it in a good generic way. Um, there is no not equal to, again, because of the, if you think about the design of those tables and how the scanning works, that's not a very easy thing to do. Uh, no uh, value does not exist, and no ors. That's, that's a big thing, is no ors. You can't say all Japanese restaurants or all Irish pubs, right? You can't get that, those, those multiple things. Now, the nice thing is because all these queries are happening over a, a connection, an existing connection to the server, um, doing multiple queries yourself is not like you're interacting with a server where, all right, well, if I do n queries, it's going to take 350 milliseconds times n, you know, plus 1 to the power of 6, you know, all that complex O to the n math. You don't have to worry about as much because that connection to the server already exists. So it's very cheap to say, well, I want all Japanese restaurants and all Irish pubs. And then you can do the intersection, you know, uh, removal on the client side. So this is something that you can do yourself. The main thing you have to think about there is if you're doing, you know, two queries and intersecting them itself, then the intersection is going to cost you double. So again, price, price things to think about. Or you could just integrate with something like, you know, uh, your SQL database or, you know, uh, BigQuery on the back end. So you can just choose a different technology for those. So there's, there's readable workarounds. So ultimately, right, uh, the nice thing here is if it works, it works. It's going to work as you scale up your application. If it's fast when you're developing it, it's going to continue to be fast. And think about how the indices are made. Um, and you know, don't, don't expect too much from it. It's, it's more powerful than the real-time database. But it is not you know, a traditional back-end SQL Server where you can have it do a lot of very, very advanced querying, joining, ORs, et cetera. Um, it's a fast, fast data store. Um, now, putting it all together, right? This, was, this is the Firestore native architecture where your client SDKs are directly talking to Firestore and then all side effects are happening through cloud functions, uh, most of them. Um, you get out of this, this effortless real-time synchronization where you don't have this pull to refresh. You get offline capabilities out of the box and ultimately this allows you to build better applications faster. Um, if you need pieces that don't fit the Firebase, our chosen technologies, you're part of Google Cloud, right? So here, instead of uh, Cloud Functions, we can use Dataflow or tools like that to get around some of the operation limits of handling you know, a Firestore when you have millions and millions of users or very, very popular article article or something like that. So you can use Dataflow to smooth that over or other technologies. Ultimately, don't try to put a square peg through a round hole just because this is the Firebase way of doing things. Think, think, can I use another Google property to achieve this with more scale and better? And uh, one last thing I wanted to pitch, if you're building backend stuff, if you have servers that you're running, maybe you don't like Node.js. Right? Uh, maybe you want to develop your backend in Java or Swift or Kotlin. Um, one last thing I wanted to pitch here was uh, we recently launched an integration with a new product out of Google Cloud called Cloud Run. And what these are are just Docker containers running on the cloud in response to HTTP requests or events. And you can write them, because it's Docker, you can just write them in whatever language you want. So if you want to make a cool backend in Kotlin or Swift or even just Node.js or something like that, uh, these are Docker applications, very fast to spin up, 
and uh, I'd recommend checking that product out. We have a cool integration with them. Uh, so thank you very much. I hope I gave you the down low on Firestore and how you can use Firestore and Google Cloud to achieve very high throughput on your applications, handle millions of users, or at least just gave you a little bit to know that we can do that and that we can support you if you achieve, achieve massive scale. And thank you very much. Um, glad to be here in Vietnam. I'm James Daniels.